Hi, this is Gary Auden. I'm bringing you an Educast, an Educast about microphones and teaching. And we're just titling it today, Ensuring Successful Classroom Audio Live and Remote Lecture Applications. With me today is Philip Stanley, Regional Sales Manager from Revo Labs. And you know he is from England because of his accent, but I'll try and get over that. Today, we're going to talk about five topics. Microphones in an educational situation isn't the same as everything else. There's a number of design issues we need to bring up, microphone considerations. Selecting a microphone is not just simply taking something out of a catalog. And we're going to talk about some best practices to help you select and use your microphones well in a classroom situation. So let's start off with the first slide, Stanley. Why is audio so important here? I think audio is, um, is so critical in education, whether that be in a small classroom, large lecture theater, um, delivery of content to students um, is absolutely important. If that is not clearly audible in a room, then the student's learning experience is, is potentially going to be confusing. Um, they might not hear things correctly. Um, I, one of the great things that happens now, however, in education is there's a lot more recording going on. So some of that can be revisited at a later date. But from a recording perspective, again, just like a video conference or a telephone call, you need that audio to be as clear and as crisp as possible. Um, most of the students globally are paying for education. They need to get value for money. They need to have good quality experiences in the lecture theatre. The audio is a huge part of that. I like this picture here because what it represents to me is that a room could be a classroom anywhere in this building. Absolutely. The traditional, of course, is the auditorium. Um, you know, maybe 50 to uh, 150, 200 seats. Certainly in the UK, um, lecture theatres maybe 500 seats at the most. In the US, of course, they, they do go um, much bigger than that. What we do find, though, is the way that students are now consuming information in a university or in an educational setting, they use in all types of rooms. It's not just a case of sitting a, a bunch of students down in a lecture theatre and lecturing to them. There are interactive classrooms. There are lots of um, PC suites. There are lots of, um, in the medical world, there will be lots of observation suites, even live operations happening in a hospital that's being broadcast into another room next door so students can do q and I've worked on projects with dentist teaching. So I think in, in a university building now or in an educational environment, any room can be a classroom. And along with that, because video conferencing is far more obtainable for people now, especially with a lot of the soft codecs, you might have an academic in one room in an auditorium in New York, and you could have a group of students sat in a university in London listening to a broadcast in a very similar way to we would find in the commercial world with video conferencing. That's now becoming a lot more global a lot more university organizations now have um, global locations and campuses all over the world. So, you know, uh, two or three students in one room, 300 in another lecture theater somewhere else, all combined into one teaching experience. I have three pictures here to just show people what you're talking about. But on the right hand side, we have six technical influences on microphones. Could you talk about some of those that are important to you? Uh, absolutely, yes. Yeah. So um, we'll, we'll go through this in the in the order they appear here. Um, typically, the size of a room is going to dictate how many students are in the room. Um, that might not always be the case because of um, you know, if you've got a large teaching space where you're doing engineering, for example, you'd have machinery and things like that. But typically, size equals students, and the bigger the room, the more students. More students you have, it's much more difficult to have every single one of those students accessing a microphone. Shape and acoustics and size often go together. Um, there are a lot of universities, the lecture theatres have incredibly high ceilings. Um, there are large spaces, they're often very echoey. Um, there's a lot of furniture in there. Students will have computers, they'll have telephones, they'll have pads, they'll have pens, all those sorts of things that can generate noise. Um, the number of attendees, of course, um, I guess this sort of ties into all these things that the more people we've got in the room, that can change the acoustic of the room. It can also technically change how the microphones work. Um, we see this with lots of different microphone technology, that the more people you have in a room, 
the more difficult sometimes it is for the RF. Um, whichever RF system you're using, it makes it more difficult for the RF to penetrate the room. So you might need additional um, antennas, um, additional technology in there to, to actually help with that. Um, the layout of rooms differs hugely. Um, there are um, the typical bank seats um, in a, a traditional auditorium type lecture theatre uh, that step back up through the room. You do see some uh, smaller teaching spaces, which is um, you know, a, a typical school classroom where you might have only 30 students in there with just rows of tables. Um, you've got a picture of a horseshoe shape, uh, what I call the horseshoe shape, sort of boardroom type table there, where you've got a main presentation happening at the front and people are sat around the outside. Just because we talk about education, the, and we talked a little bit about any room can be a classroom, but um, when we talk about education, this is not just students listening, this is students taking part, um, students engaging, um, and the pictures we have here are very typical classrooms, but as I say, if you've got a, um, a university that's teaching engineering, or you're in the medical world, there are so many different types of layouts that have to be taken into consideration. Um, interestingly, power is there. One of the things that um, happens an awful lot, and we see this happening a lot in education, certainly in lecture theatres now, as they're refurbished, is how do we handle power? Um, a lot of these lecture theatres were built at the time when nobody had a smartphone, nobody had a laptop, everybody walked in with a traditional pen or pencil and a pad, took notes and left the lecture theatres. So now, how do we actually power all of the units that students are likely to bring in that are also becoming an intrinsic part of the academics approach to teaching the students? That brings up the next question, and it's that there are a bunch of design issues. Would you go through these? Which ones are really worth considering? Which ones do you find the most problems with? Let, let's go to point number two. Sorry to, uh, to do this, but we'll, we'll miss out point number one and go to point number two first. Um, pretty much most microphone you'll find in a, in, in a, a lecture theatre or certainly in education, they're only used for voice. There is no need to go for a very expensive um, music capable. We're not singers. We're going to stand and deliver a lecture. Um, or deliver a class, um, and that may only be uh, recorded and recorded into a PC. So bandwidth then really is, is not a huge issue uh, because of compression and everything else that happens as, as part of the recording. From a pickup point of view, if you just have an omnidirectional mic sat in the middle of the classroom, you are going to pick up all the good things that you want, but you will also pick up all the bad audio that you don't want. Background noise, the bell going off, all sorts of things that, that you don't need. Directional mics, maybe. Um, the most important microphone that, that we would put in there is a clip-on mic. So whether that be an all-in-one clip-on microphone or a belt pack with a, a wired traditional lavalier type microphone, that is the most ideal because it will remove pretty much all of the background noise that you don't want in there. Um, from a, uh, a lecture voice lift point of view, um, a Lavalier will give you the microphone closer to the point of audio and therefore that should generally give you a much better audio quality once that's amplified back out into the room for the students. From a lecture capture point of view, um, we tend to find that most people will still go with a clip-on mic. There may be handheld mics in there as well for Q&A for the students, so the microphone can be handed to a student so they can do a, a live Q&A. Um, but we also find from a, a lecture capture point of view, that not every room will have a fully installed AV infrastructure. So if I take a lecture theatre, for example, that has 60 to 100 seats, we would probably have a lectern, a microphone, uh, some sort of panel on the lectern, maybe a Crestron Extra on AMX type control system, large screen display, and my computer or device that's capturing the lecture is just wired into that entire solution. That's great in a large room where the budgets are set a little bit higher to install that sort of equipment, but in a small room where you have an AV plate on the wall and maybe a, uh, a large format display or a projection screen on the wall, people don't have the budget and they don't want to have all the complicated AV gear in there, so they need something simple. And we often see very simple USB type um, uh, boundary mics, be it omni or directional, sat on the lectern or even just stuck on the wall. We often see them all hanging from the ceiling. And the problem with those is that uh, same sort of thing. You capture all the audio you don't want to, along alongside all the others. The most important thing, and this is something the Reval Labs have talked about for a long time, is the right type of microphone in the right position will give you the best possible quality of audio. That leads into the slide. It's a next nice segue into selecting the right microphone. 
you have three different ideas here. Would you enumerate those, please? Uh, yes. So um, ideal for podiums and tables, the gooseneck microphone, absolutely perfect. It gets the microphone elevated off the desk uh, and um, creates a very close pickup pattern. So um, reduces a lot of the background noise. Wireless microphones, they give us mobility. Um, when I stand and deliver a presentation, I move around an awful lot. Some people will stand firmly behind their lectern, um, but an awful lot of people do want to move. There are a lot of interactive products now, uh, screens, touch screens, things like that appearing in um, classrooms, so that uh, mobility is required. Wearable mics, um, as we've just been talking about, they give you the most, um, the highest quality audio because the microphone is closer to the mouth and therefore it just gives you much better audio quality. One of the points about you're talking about moving around gets me into the question, a lot of these have to be battery driven. Why is that an issue? Uh, so uh, batteries are batteries. We all have uh, cell phones, mobile phones, and they all need recharging at some point. And you get exactly the same with uh, with microphones. There are lots of ways of doing it. Sometimes you can just replace an old battery with a new one. Um, if you don't have a rechargeable, of course, from an environmental point of view, people want to move away from that. Um, from a recharging point of view, of course, you have to remember to put it on the charger at the end of the day. And we do see, and I certainly see with some of my customers, people will actually have two microphones in a room even when they only need one so that they can always make sure one is sat on the charger. Um, there is, of course, the other part of this. If, if something isn't wired down and fastened down, what happens if that microphone leaves the room? Making sure they're recharged. Um, there are lots of different ways in which that can happen. Um, some people have uh, chargers on the table. Some people have microphones where you book them in and book them out. Um, so you actually return them to a main reception area. This point, I think, is very important. A lot of people in IT think they can do this, but you're saying talk to the AV department. Keep them in mind. Absolutely. I think we all know as, as AV and IT converges and continues to converge, there are lots of ways in which AV can actually benefit from IT. Um, a lot of equipment now, whether that's a microphone or a control system, whatever's going into a, a classroom, can be sat on the network. And that really does help the AV administrator remotely monitor the system as you put in the slides, quickly respond to issues. If you're going to walk across a big campus, we see this is a difference between the office world and the um, education world. Typically in an office, you might have one building with 15 floors and everybody in there. In the university world, we see 15 rooms across the entire campus. So yeah, the AV teams, Having the capability to remotely manage equipment is absolutely vital now. You have another point here, and you have DECT. What makes DECT important for wireless? So from a, a DECT point of view, um, there, there is the, um, the traditional radio mic. Um, DECT is a fully digital part of the spectrum. A couple of really important things. Number one, they sit outside of all of the RF spectrums. So as our mobile phone companies go and buy spectrum so they can do all of their data, and we sit outside and therefore we're not susceptible to be um, uh, sort of eaten into in terms of what we can do in that spectrum. DECT is also digital and, and crucially in the education world, it's allowed us to put a lot more microphones in the same geographical space than you would do with a traditional radio mic. Um, it's also very secure. So you get a minimum 128 bit encryption. Um, each microphone is, a, is dedicated to its original base unit. So if I happen to leave a microphone clipped on and wander from one building to another, I'm not inadvertently going to broadcast out into another lecture theater in, in another building. Let's move forward and talk about the points of selecting right microphone. What are two or three of the points that are most important? Um, so I guess the, the most important thing for the right microphone um, uh, looking down your list here, um, preferentially captures the speaker's voice over noise. Is probably the most important thing in there. Clarity of audio, having a microphone attached to a person in the best possible position will absolutely maximize the quality of the audio. Um, from the terms of the lecture capture systems, that is also massively important. Um, but microphones that are really easy to work with lecture capture systems are also great. As I say, I mentioned this earlier on, there's a lot of people try and use software or they do use software for um, lecture capture. So if you've got a traditional microphone with lots of audio wires and you've got a computer with USB ports, 
that doesn't always sit nicely together. So there are um, there are different types of microphones on the market where you can just have a USB um, plugged straight into the PC and a little clip-on microphone that uh, that goes with it. Um, one of the other things from from our point of view is is the environmental burden of, of replacing batteries all the time. The last and final point on the bottom around spectrum challenges. There are huge challenges already with the RF spectrum with the internet of things and a whole range of other things that are happening in the mobile telephony world, that's only going to increase and, and the deck spectrum sits beautifully in the middle. Let's then summarize this in some best practices. Okay, so from a, a best practices point of view, um, a lot of these are around, um, I guess, everything that Reva Labs has, has stood for for a number of years, which is the right type of microphone in the right position, used in the right way, will massively enhance the quality of the audio. So making sure your microphone is, is close to the person. The wearable mics are brilliant for that because they're not too obtrusive. They clip on, they're close to the mouth. You don't have to have um, the microphone tuned in such a way to try and pick up too much noise. And therefore the pickup is very close. So we remove a lot of the background noise uh, by that type of microphone. And um, in terms of the uh, additional handheld mics, we see an awful lot of that. And that's very much from a Q&A point of view. A student's question is often as important, if not more important, than the actual answer that the teacher or the academic would actually give back to that. So making sure that student's voice is heard is also hugely important. And from a lecture capture point of view, um, we see that happen in two ways. Sometimes we will find that the best practice for certain people is that they will give the microphone to the student and that will be recorded. Sometimes we find that the um, academic will be asked the question by the student and the academic will automatically repeat the question so that the question is nice and clear and then give the answer. So that on a recording, the, um, the answers are as clear as possible. I'm going to change direction a bit because we've been talking about the technology. Let's talk about what's Yamaha and Revo Labs and how are they related to all of this? Okay, so um, Reva Labs has been around for 12 or so years. I've been with Reva Labs six and a half of that. Um, three and a half years ago, we were acquired by Yamaha, which I'm sure is a brand that the, uh, the listeners to this will, will know very well. Um, Reva Labs' history um, is all around wireless microphones. That's where we came from. That's what we've always done. Over the last um, five years, um, a huge part of our market has changed or has certainly evolved um, and that is the video conferencing world. So as part of the Yamaha acquisition and Yamaha's um, desire to move into the more commercial meeting room, boardroom type marketplace, um, they acquired Reva Labs um, at the time. And still now we build product for Cisco. We build all of Cisco's newest uh, conference phones for them. We also now have an entire range of our own UC products. And interestingly, we see as much um, interest in those products now in the education world as we do with the wireless mics. Um, we, I mentioned this earlier on that the uh, consumption of video conferencing is evolving from a hardware platform to very much a software platform. The introduction of Skype for Business has also um, has actually sped that up uh, quite significantly. Um, in the US, you have a lot of products things like Zoom and we have Blue Jeans and there are a huge amount of um, desktop platforms out there. Interestingly, that also alters some of the equipment that goes into lecture theatres. But the, um, the whole Yamaha Viva Labs group now, we have products for like theatres, meeting rooms, boardrooms, conference rooms. Um, we have smaller products that are designed to go into maybe six to eight seater uh, smaller rooms. Um, I mentioned this earlier on that um, you know, there are universities now, they've got remote campuses globally. Uh, they want to tie into other working professionals to deliver lectures. So that allows them to combine not just the traditional microphone technology, but also the more uh, the modern sort of unified comms type market. And then we have another product coming out very shortly, um, which is the soundbar device that you can see there on the screen, which is a joint product between Yamaha and Reva Labs. And that's really now where that relationship is starting to head, that our, our engineers and the Yamaha engineers are now working together to bring the best of breeds of both worlds. This next slide looks like a set of questions I should be asking myself or you should be asking me as a customer. Is that correct? Yeah, pretty much so. And, and a lot of these things also have to be uh, have to be done on site because there's nothing like standing in the room that you want to put your microphones into and understanding the acoustics. You can never understand the acoustics of a room from a photograph. So um, we always want to find out 
how big the room is, how many people do we need to support in terms of numbers of microphones, and um, how is that room built. Um, there are very good examples right now of customers that we have their meeting rooms, for example, are just four walls of glass and they're incredibly echoey. Um, some of the universities that we deal with are very traditional and quite old buildings. They have high ceilings, very hard surfaces. Um, you put the HVAC noise on there. That's something that crops up all over the place. And um, the other thing that we miss out in terms of here is how many students and what are the students doing in the room, because that also has a tendency to, to generate a whole, load of, a whole load of other noise. From an audio uh, performance point of view, this is interesting. Um, historically, Reva Labs, microphones going into teaching spaces, if there was any sort of uh, processor in there, it was either what I call a good old fashioned twiddly knob mixer, um, so a traditional microphone mixer or a more modern um, digital processor. Historically, they've generally been around bringing um, audio streams into one device to then send that out to the room or um, uh, to a recording. More recently, as video conferencing has become more prevalent, that has now actually introduced the need for echo cancellation technology, potentially in lecture theatres where they might want to do a video conference from one lecture theatre to another. So those sorts of things are hugely important. Things like duplex, it's very much more around the video side, of course, um, than just the standard voice lift, but those things all need to be taken into consideration. What are we actually plugging into? In the traditional world, we had a mixer, we had XLR connections, and we would plug that into an amplifier and that would come out of speakers. People are now using PCs, Macs, uh, Google Chromeboxes, um, different uh, products for lecture capture as well. Some lecture capture devices are um, hardware devices that are built specifically for that job. Some lecture capture devices are um, essentially embedded Windows PCs that your input is going over USB. And an awful lot of rooms now, your academic or your teacher is carrying their notebook or laptop with them, and they just want a device in the room, they plug straight in, and that's always going to be USB. Now, Revo Labs does have a number of solutions, and there are four of them here on the screen. Can you contrast those four for us? Uh, yeah, so um, uh, very uh, simply, the, um, the executive elite wireless system that you've got over on the left-hand side, that's going to work in conjunction with the microphones, the, the, the sort of three types of microphones that we've got there. Um, there are a, a number of, this is only one part of the uh, Reva Labs product range that we typically sell into education. Um, they come as a two channel, a four channel, or an eight channel. And by that, I mean how many microphones you can have associated with any unit. And you can add those units together so you could have 16 or 24 in, in a room if you needed to. Um, what you can see in the middle there is the Reva Labs wearable mic. Um, that's a little clip on mic and um, it clips on your shirt. It, they all come with a little um, Reva Labs lanyard so you can hang it around the neck. It's a great microphone, it sits very close, sort of, um, I guess, probably three or four inches under the chin. It sits very close to the mouth so it cuts down an awful lot of the background noise. Um, very simple to use. There are no wires, there are no complications in there. Um, the handheld, uh, we have a, what we call the XLR adapter that allows you to clip on your own handheld mic. Um, as long as it's dynamic, then that allows us to give that around the students. The gooseneck mic, we generally find that fits into two locations in a lecture theatre. One will be absolutely on the podium, and so I've got my microphone in a fixed position, or generally fixed position, um, and it gets the microphone up off the table and, and close to me as I'm stood. Um, but we do also find that sometimes people will have a Q&A panel they've had a visiting lecturer or they've had an event, they may end up with a Q&A panel, three or four people, and the goosenecks are great because you can go and quickly sit them on the table in front of the people. When you're finished, you can go and pack them all away. And I don't have to have wires scattered all over the floor to, uh, to do that. Well, thank you very much, Philip. I appreciate your time. I'd like to point you're out welcome. to people that there's a phone number here in the US and Canada available for consultation and questions. And here's a good article, a Sound Matters, that I think would help you understand what we were talking about. Thank you again, and thank you for listening. No worries. Thank you.